when I was talking to Britt just now, he said everybody that lived all of our ages, whatever age we are, everybody lived in the case knew about the Billy Meyer case. And uh, we basically uh, uh, were, what I got from everyone was um, that the pictures were too good and couldn't be real and mm -hmm. uh, and and it was Photoshop and, and they were giving me these things without recognize recognizing that Photoshop didn't start until 1992. Right. That but the, the pictures are too real. It's crazy because I just did an interview with the Friendship Amicizia case in Italy, the Pescata case, which was in 1956, and the pictures are incredibly clear. And it was in Italy, so Americans didn't hear about it. But the photographs are incredible, too. So I thought, as a journalist, what's going on here is it's staged. Whatever is going on, it's staged in that the beings want their photos taken, want the photos of the crap, until they don't, until they don't, <laughs> until they don't uh, for a particular reason. So the 1956 case, I was thinking of where I was in 1956. I saw the pictures on, on the Pescata coast of the Adriatic Sea, the a friendship case. And I'm going, this is going on all over the world, but we don't know about it because it's in another country. And mm -hmm. the Meyer case just happens to be in Switzerland. And half of the people don't even know like where it is. So uh, let alone that I always, the arguments I've got, oh, it's on a fishing pole or, you know, it's CGI or anything. I'm going, no, no, nothing, of what you say, <laughs> nothing of what you say makes sense because we're dealing with 1970s, 1970s. And- uh, 76, yeah. And, and, Before the personal computer was even developed. Yes. So- we got reasons uh, to to look at everything and to and and then I always tell I just talked to a major actor in Hollywood. He goes, "Oh, that story, you know, he 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 hung uh he hung a fishing pole and had." I said, "Oh yeah, and that's a fishing pole, and all the cars are in the highway underneath the, the craft, <laughs> one armed." <laughs> He's got a fishing. <laughs> it's like the crazy arguments. So. I end up as a researcher uh, saying uh, your opinion is not research. So did I go to Switzerland? Yes. Did I see Bill Murray? Yes. And I'm going to introduce Britt in a minute, but I have to say that when I went to see Billy Meyer, I'm going to tell my story. I went with three Italians and we went to Smith Rudy and we sat in the Semyazi meditation garden and the best book that's written is, I, I do not support Michael Horn, I'll say that right off, uh, is <laughs> Guido Musburger, who was a skeptical doctor uh, who lives in uh, uh, in Switzerland, very skeptical, a book called And Still They Fly. Now, when I went, he was alive, and Billy saw me, and Billy was nervous about speaking English, so he basically sent Guido Mosburger down with me to me with my two Italian friends. And he said, I'm here to answer questions that you have. Billy said, and, and, and of course, I didn't have any, uh, too many questions. I, I saw the hole in the, in the, that, uh, what's his name that Billy uh, uh, talks about with the uh, gun or whatever that was. Oh, with the ray gun. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the tree. I saw that he was living in a um, in a chalet, that it was more of a commune. There was a lot of people in that chalet. And I want you to go into detail uh, about this, Britt. Uh, I saw that uh, I went to all the hills where the photos were taken so that I could see the, uh, the you know, the, the landscape, which is gorgeous. I don't think Smith Rudy is that easy to find, but they did tell me that on Sundays it's open to the general public, so he's not where you can't get to him. Uh, and 
and then uh, I I had already lived through a $300 phone call from Ellen Hynek to Wendell Stevens in my house that I had to pay the bill for <laughs> <laughs> about Billy because kind of <clears throat> the house and I said Wendell Stevens is on the phone and Wendell who I consider one of the greatest researchers that ever walked planet Earth, mostly because he was a field researcher and he went all over the world. He did so much work. He did so much work. And he and I hope you elaborate. He did the Billy Meyer case uh, with you and your husband, Lee. And before right. I went to see Billy Meyer, before I went to see him, what had happened was that I spent five hours in the Tucson airport making sure that I asked Wendell all the proper questions. And one of the things that Wendell told me, and, and Britt, I want you to talk more about this, was that when he, when he was in the chalet with Billy, it would be snowing and he would, and Billy would get the call to go and meet the, the Plagiarians and, and Billy would walk out the back door and his footprints would disappear in the snow, yeah. in the snow. And then, We filmed it. You filmed yeah. it? Yeah, we and filmed it. Oh, and say, come and get me, and he's too, too, uh, that better? It's over. I think so. Village is over. Thank you. So, uh, he was two villages over, uh, and so what would happen is that you'd have to go pick him up. Now, I'm going to show this. I don't know if you have that in front of you, Britt, because these are the picture books that I bought back then, uh, the Billy Meyer the picture books, and you know, with one guy that has uh, one arm and uh, the photographs and the film, the movies, and I want you to go into right. detail. Um, it is part of my archive of human ET contact. A lot mm -hmm. of the early days, the human ET contact has been subverted in favor of the abduction scenario. So, right want you taking human ETs to Starbucks to have coffee. So the general people that are working this UFO field are kind of closing down anything having to do with the Space Brother movement, human ETs, whether they're Storm Venus, Hades, or whatever. I want to say that up front because I'm one of the only researchers that has researched the early days into the 70s and, and the Space Brother move, and then I went to Latin America to follow that up. Um, and it's very important people look at the overall picture of contact and see the overall history that we have accumulated uh, in, in this particular situation. So um, I want to introduce formally now uh, my good friend, who supported me, and I have to thank Shirley McLean also because Shirley McLean supported my Laughlin conferences, which were extremely serious conferences. Britt Elders and Britt, begin by talking about you, your husband, and Wendell, and how you all got started on this. Okay, first of all, I've got to say I'm sorry because my voice is kind of iffy. I've got I've been out shoveling snow the last two days and. A lot of sinus going on. But anyway, Wendell Stevens was an amazing, amazing researcher. He literally went all over the world. Nothing stopped him. He he stepped off the investigative side of things, and he really became a proponent of UFO cases. And that's how he approached them. But he got information that nobody else could. He called us one day and said, you have to come down here. He was in Tucson. We were in Phoenix at the time. And we said, what's going on? He says, well, there's a lady here. Her name is Lou Zinstag. And she's from Switzerland. And she's got some photographs. And you got to see these photographs. Well, at the time, Lee and I had a company, the Electronic Countermeasure, that we kept Fortune 500 companies from being bugged and wiretapped. We really didn't want to throw our company Intercept into a UFO case and lose all of our credibility because at that time, this subject was not credible. But we went down, we looked at the photographs. First reaction, too good to be true. Then we sat and talked with Lou Zinstog. 
amazing woman. She had known Meyer for years. She had followed the different things he was doing. And this was back in 76. He had been taking photographs of at that particular time for about a year. And he they were filtering out a little bit here and there. Uh, Der Stern and Blick had picked it up. They were running some of the photographs and people were starting to come to him. Wendell Stevens was afraid that what would happen is that people would start stealing all the material. So he said, I really want you involved with this case. And we kind of said no and backed away for about six months. He went over and saw Billy and he came back and he says, I've looked the man in the eye. He's real. We had a, a sweep in London and we decided, well, we'll just go to Switzerland. And, and Lee was so determined this was going to be, yeah, I'm going to look at it and figure out how it's done and we're going home. And I was curious. Um, my background is my dad was literally a rocket engineer, worked with Werner von Braun. So this wasn't unusual to me. This was really cool. We got over there. We ended up spending a week with Meyer. He gave us, he literally brought a shoebox out and he handed it to Lee and he says, this is for you. I'm supposed to give it to you. It had metal samples in it. It had an audio recording of the craft. It had inner negatives of the photographs. It had movie footage in it. And he says, it's yours. Take it back to the States and analyze it. And we did. And that's how that all in a nutshell began. Probably one of the most interesting aspects of the case is that they planned for Billy to have this information so that he could bring it out to the public using a source like Intercept and their reputation, our reputation at the time, to bring it out because we had to legitimately take it to scientists that knew what the hell they were talking about. And that was pretty hard to find. Most of the time when you took something to a scientist, they weren't interested because it had that UFO stigma attached to it. And they turned away from it immediately. Many times we would go into laboratories and we couldn't tell people, okay, you're looking at something, but we're not going to tell you what it is. Or you're hearing a sound that's unusual. It was just, you know, it was one of the most difficult things we'd ever done is find proper scientists. But then a man by the name of Jim Della Toso got involved. And Jimmy D is amazing. He can sit down and talk to anybody about anything on any level. He is a brilliant man. He's a great photogrammetric anal analyst. But he got us into places like Scripps Institute, JPL, University of Arizona with Dr. Michael Malin. And we worked with these people and they they were fabulous. They didn't necessarily, necessarily believe in UFOs or in a contact case but they were really intrigued because they couldn't figure out how Meyer was doing it. So it was something that uh, the more we got into it, the more convinced Lee was, especially Wendell was already over the top. He believed the case was real. There was no question in his mind. I still had a few things that I had to figure out in my own mind how this all happened and how it unfolded. But from photographs, we went into metal and Dr. Marcel Vogel with IBM. And from there, he took it into all of these different places, Ames Research. He worked with 42 different scientists on this metal. And the problem that they were having is at that time, we didn't have the space shuttle. We didn't have all of this great technology we have today. But when they were looking at it through a scanning electron microscope, what they were finding was that there was crystal that was separating the metal. So it was a crystalline structure and a metal structure and a crystalline structure, metal structure. It had to be done someplace where you didn't have gravity and it had to be done through a cold fusion process rather than heat like how when we make metal, we pour it, we heat it, and we pour it into what we need. This was completely different, boggled everybody's minds. And all of that, it's all discussed in detail 
in the new book, Contact from the Pleiades, which, by the way, is volume one and volume two together with a lot more information in it. They're hardbound together, 200 pages, and this is this will be out in April. So those that weren't around in the 70s when we released volume one and volume two will now have an opportunity to see it and see what went into the investigation because it was extensive. Totally amazing. When you were there, um, did you get a feeling that the Swiss government wasn't exactly excited about this perfect case? How did you guys navigate yeah. politics around this? Because one of the problems I tell people is whenever you have a contactee that does this, then there's pilgrimages, you know, like religious pilgrimages that go to his house and, and he becomes a personality and the governments don't like that. Well, that's partly it, but there was another issue too. Right above Meyer's farmhouse, um, what was going on was there's this little hill, and then beyond that little hill is a massive military base. So they're looking down on his farmhouse at all times. Meyer was pretty convinced, and we were too, that they were monitoring communications coming and going from the house, as well as the people coming and going from the house. Um they didn't like all of the strangers from all over the world, literally, showing up at Meyer's house right underneath their big secret military base. So that was one of the big issues. They also didn't like the fact that Meyer, um, and this is back in the 70s, was allowing magazines like Blick and Der Stern to come in and interview him and television stations from Zurich to come in and interview him. They didn't like that at all because it was drawing more attraction to what they were doing up there on that hill. So that was a big problem for them. A lot of people ask us if we had ever had any government interference, and I have to say we never did. In fact, we worked with government labs, but we made a very open decision right in the beginning. If we want to get to the laboratories, and to the scientists that actually have the knowledge and the tools to examine the evidence we have, we've got to work with them. So we agreed to share everything that was found. They recorded it, they either videotaped it, or they recorded it into a tape recorder what they had found. They talked to us. We never let the material out of our hands, except for Marcel Vogel. And... It was wonderful. We had a great working relationship. They didn't want their names out there, like Boeing Labs, when we were up in Seattle with them analyzing the sounds with Rob Shellman, who was a naval engineer. They said, okay, all Boeing name tags have to go off. They've got to vanish. Nobody can know where you are, but we'll let you use our lab. So that was the type of, of back and forth we had with government facilities, and it worked beautifully for us. But that was in the 1970s when very few people even believed in UFOs. And, and that's right. Yeah, things have changed a little bit since then. Yeah. Can you tell us, Shirley McLean went to see him too. Can you explain or tell us <laughs> stories about what she, she did? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a funny story there. Shirley called us. We had just been to Switzerland and just come back. Shirley called us and said, I want to go meet Meyer. And Lee says, I don't care who you are. We're not running tours. And he hung up on her. And uh, she called back about two hours later and said, let me explain. I'm writing a book called Out on a Limb. <laughs> so from there, we decided, okay, we would help if we could. And we went back in October of uh, 1980 and took her over there. I had a great time. She spent five days with him. Shirley's a question machine. She never stops asking questions. And boy, she, from sunup to sundown, it was just nonstop. What do they look like? Why are they here? What are they doing here? And he kept saying, give me a break. Let me have a little break. And then we'd go through the whole thing. Why are they here? She was like, I don't know if any of you have spent time with indigenous people, but they have a tendency to ask the same question over and over again to see if they get the same answer. 
that was Shirley MacLaine. Oh, she is amazing. I mean, but she did she is course, Britt, because people to find her credible, she would yeah. she went on like a Good Morning America. She went on newscasts and she made it normal. It's like no yeah. need over it. It's real. And what I agree about, and she even does that today, is talk about it. There's no dialogue like it's serious. And and, and mm -hmm. to her, we we are tremendously grateful to somebody. Like, I could never have the power or, or the credibility of going on major TV or, or, you know, any major situation to talk about it the way she did. So when you see her, thank her for that. Thank her for that, because I know you still work. I will. You still work with her. Um, I do, and I talk to her every day, so I will tell her. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing that people don't know, because I've done so much research on human type beings, is that both George Adamski and Billy Meyer were trained in India. Or it's not that they, yeah. they went to India. In, in the case of right. he, he went to Tibet. He, he, in fact, his early lectures were called uh, something of lecture of Tibet. And so they uh -huh. had a uh, esoteric background, like a Buddhist or, uh, you know, some kind of Asian uh, philosophy where the beings that came to visit them were already comfortable with what they believed. So right. it's easy to plug into, and we haven't talked about the uh, uh, the plagiarians yet. We haven't talked about what they believe and what they said because I'm sure everybody here was curious. But it's easier mm -hmm. to dialogue with somebody that has a spiritual background already mm -hmm. when it's a spiritual message than it is to, to pick somebody off the street that doesn't have anything. So can do you know what Billy told you about his sightings in, uh, was it in India? It was in India. He was living in an ashram and he was basically studying to balance himself. In fact, it was in India that he lost his arm in a bus accident. He uh, wanted to learn about consciousness and that's why he went to India. But he also, he traveled all over the world. He was in Turkey. He was in um the Arab nations, he just ventured out into the world to learn whatever he could. He was a true kind of free spirit for a long time. One of the things that Simyasa said, that was the cosmonaut that was talking to Billy, was that they decided to reach out to him with a woman because men were not aggressive towards women. So that's why they brought a female in to initially start the conversations. Um, but Billy had a history already, because when he was five, he watched UFOs over Germany. And his father told him, don't worry about that. It's Hitler's new craft. So they kind of poo-pooed it, ignored it, and pretended it was all about Hitler. Billy knew, because he had telepathic contact as a child. But then he was also guided into India and some of these places where he met with people from the doll universe, different universes. Um, Fobo Chang, I don't know if you've ever spoken with her. She is an amazing lady, was an ambassador and was present while Billy was having contacts in India and different places. And they had a wonderful relationship and she witnessed several different things. She's getting elderly now, but I do know that she has done a recent interview, which will be released probably next year. So that's good. Um, the whole idea of the Pleiadians coming in was, according to Simyasa telling Billy, Billy telling us, was to get humans to realize they are not the only thinking beings in the universe. That we have to realize that our actions here have repercussions throughout the universe. We talked to him about, what does that mean? Is it like nuclear war? What does that do? He said, absolutely, because a nuclear war here would not just affect us, but the energy of that event would affect the entire universe. So we have to become more responsible for ourselves as humans 
living in a little tiny piece of the galaxy, of the universe, and we're not doing it. It's not just about caring for the planet. It's not just about raising our own consciousness. It's not just about what's happening on this planet at this time, at this particular moment. It's about how we interact with the cosmos. And we're not to a point yet, even recently, we're not to a point yet, that we can actually hold that interaction without some form of judgment. We could learn so much from each other if we could, but we can't right now. It's uh, a good portion of us are still locked into this third dimensional plane and don't want to expand it any further. With Samyazi and her father, and 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 the, the the idea that her father had facial hair, you know that yeah, that, in a way because we've seen uh you know depictions of of human type beings, but none of them with beards, uh, you know, or facial hair. How did they um how did they explain their relationship to us? that their forefathers were our forefathers, that they have a special interest in us because we're like cousins and they don't want to see us fail. They want to see us be able to mature on a spiritual level as well as on the physical level in which we exist. And they're physical beings too, but their their body and their all of the things around them in their physical world vibrates at a slightly different frequency than ours. So they come in for a short, short time into earth in this area, can communicate with people, but they can't stay here for long, long periods of time because that frequency shift that they have to go through is so different. What, uh, you know, I'm real. I'm sure a lot of, of our, you know, uh, viewers want to ask you questions about the actual, you know, uh, uh, plagiarians. But I heard other things that are really interesting that I would like you to comment on. Wendell, okay. five hours there, explained to me that they showed, the plagiarians showed Billy on a television monitor the future. And that they also showed him the death of one of the popes uh, that he was assassinated. Uh, he was there at the time. They were there at the time. So what exactly did you see? Because at that particular time, when Wendell told me what he saw on the screen, I had dreamt it. I dreamed it. I said, because wow. that's what I saw in my dream. But uh, yeah. a little bit about the fact that they can see the future because in my research time travel drives me crazy <laughs> well here's how they explain it which after really thinking it through makes so much sense to me if you have event a happen and event b happen event c is bound to happen so it's not that they so much see into the future and can predict everything, every single thing that's going to happen. They have what they call an event clock. Um, they saw, I'll give you a quick example if I can. When we were in Switzerland with Shirley, we were taking her to the airport when we got to the airport, we learned that Sadat of Egypt had been assassinated. Everybody had all of these different versions that was coming over the news saying it happened this way or it happened that way. Nobody really knew. Then the televisions went dark and all you had in Switzerland was a white screen with a red cross. We got back to the farmhouse. We dropped Shirley at the airport, got back to the farmhouse, sat down with Billy. He brought out a bunch of notes that he had typed up months before. And he says, this is what happened. He was killed during a military parade. And he went through the whole thing that actually happened with Sadat. The Pleiadians had told him because of different events that had occurred, the meeting with the Israelis and the Egyptians, all of these different things had told them 
that the event of Sadat's assassination would occur. And here's how it would occur. So that was probably the best explanation we had for their concept of an event clock. But did Billy actually see on the television screen some of the stuff? He said he did. He didn't know if it was real or if it was projected based on what their event clock had predicted for them. And could an event change it? Yes, that was a possibility. So that wasn't, it wasn't something that is said, oh, here's your future and it's outlined this way. These are possible events. And that's what he was told. They were possible events, but nothing written in stone. Well, that's beautiful because we're in a situation now where if it, somebody predicts the future, at least we have the hope of being able to change one of the chains in the chain of that. Exactly. To another timeline. And that mm -hmm. gives people that are spiritual, that don't like things that are happening to be able to change that timeline um right so i i'm very interested in the way they deal with time uh and uh so and, and the idea that they look so much like us the other thing yeah. to this case that i have a million questions but they didn't come with just one craft they came with like four different or five different crafts total of six Six variations of ships. Um, one ship they had to retire because it was leaking radiation. We took uh, Wild Heberg equipment in, which is, they measure radiation forms all over the world. They've got great equipment. We measured Billy's moped, his belt buckle, the first contact site, and this was 14 years later, and it was still hot. It was, I mean, it was pegging the meter. And the guy from Wild Hearburg said, I've got to <laughs> alert the nuclear commission here because this is really bad. And we said, you can't do that. Yeah, it's just keep it quiet. But we think Billy had some physical problems also caused by the gamma radiation he was experiencing from that first several encounters with the uh, first variation one. And then the other variations were to, to show the, the, the real people that are interested in this, that they had scout ships, that they had uh, bigger ships, and so forth. It was like it was a parade. It was like... Right. They also well, it's like us with a car. Because when we, let's just say we've got electric cars now, but what's going on with the gas car to the electric car what happens is you've got a situation where there's a transition. It's the same thing with the ships. What we call the wedding cake ship, which is the last ship that he photographed. It has little balls all around the edges of it. That was for propulsion. So they changed their propulsion system. Therefore, the design of the ship changed. And they didn't just call them spacecraft or anything like that. They called them beam ships because they ran on what they call, and I have to use their term because it seems to be a little different as than what we understand tachyon to be, but they used a form of tachyon propulsion. And this propulsion would take them from point A to point B in no time. They would have to slowly get to the space where they could enter point A, and then they would come out of point B slowly into this new area of space. Um, Tachyons, we met with McVeigh in Scotland. He was this brilliant astronomer, and he had been working on them for years as a form of propulsion. David Froning, Alan Holt, these guys worked with the concept of tachyons for a long, long time. So it wasn't something that was out there in the public when Billy was writing his notes and talking about tachyon propulsion, but we managed and this was back in 1978, to find these people that were actually working on it and they could explain it. It was brilliant. So then when they changed propulsion systems, they changed ship. And then they had a little drone craft too, the small one that wandered around and just sort of monitored what was happening around the earth. 
Now the drone craft uh, are like little uh, globes, aren't they? They're like little circle, uh, little globes. They're a sphere, but they have a flat top. They don't have the cupola at all, and they're not seven meters, which is the traditional size of the craft. They're only about seven feet in diameter. Okay, did the plagiarians tell him that there were other people they were contacting on the planet? Or? No. No, and this is interesting because I've run into this with so many of the contactees that we've worked with. You call them plagiarians, I call them Pleiadians because that's what Billy told us to call them in the very beginning, so that's what I call them. Same group, though. But the, uh, the Pleiadians seemed to tell Billy he was the only one having contact. We met several other contactees over the years, and they've all said the same thing. And when you dig into it, it's sort of providing the contactee a sense of comfort and support through that. Because eventually they learn there's a lot of people out there having contact. But in the beginning, they need that support. Nope, you're the only one we're talking to. And it could be that they are the only one Simyasa was talking to or Ketzel or Ptah. Billy was the only one for them. And these other people that are having Pleiadian contact are having it with their specific contact and not associated to the same group like Simyasa, Ptah, and Ketzel that Billy had. Well, what's so amazing is that the picture, I think it was of Ascot, that there is one right. of Ascot, because I use it in my presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I've talked to other contactees who have photographed women and have, uh, uh, you know, and they're legitimate. I consider it legitimate. They're blaming it on her being one of the uh, chorus girls in the Dean Martin show, and they completely, right. and they completely just that picture. Are you crazy? He's a, he's a farmer in Switzerland, and he doesn't watch the Dean Martin show. So why would he take a picture of one of the chorus girls who looks like Askit? And then one of the things I notice, and I'm going to add personal stuff, is whenever I see a picture of who says they're from somewhere else, their earlobe in is, is in a different place. And if you look at the picture, of it comes Africa, way down. earlobe is way down here in I'm... a completely different place from a human. Did you notice that? Oh, yes. Yeah. We did a whole study on that with contactees from South America, North America, and Europe. And we found that most of the contactees described that their contact, the earlobes, literally came right into the jawline down low. So that seems to be a common trait with the quote unquote Nordic looking beings. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so but the thing with the Dean Martin picture, um, I really don't know where that got started, who started it, but the woman according to Billy, is from the doll universe. She is standing there with another companion. She's blonde. The other one is dark-haired. Um, it's one of those things you cannot analyze. So as an investigator, you have to sit back. you got to look at the hard evidence you can thump on. And then you've got to go to, okay, what does this mean? Do I throw the whole case out? Because there's a questionable picture? You can't do that. There's just too many things in life that you do not have answers for. And that happens to be one of them. Nobody knows exactly where, who, or anything else besides Billy. And that's okay. But the other evidence is so substantial, Paola. It's just, it was given to him to show people that they exist. Now we've got to start waking up to that fact that they do. One last thing before I start talking about the reissue of the book is that mm -hmm. somebody, I was told the Japanese were really interested in it and came and bought the movies, the photos, and the metal. And other no. people, that's not true. Yeah. I can tell you right now that is not true. Number one, I have the inner negatives, I have the movie footage, and I have the metal samples, and I have the original sound recordings, and they are in a bank vault. So, no, somebody lied. The Japanese are definitely interested in this, but we've worked with Junichi Yaoi, 
Michi Saeto. For years and years, since 1978, we took Nippon Television to Billy's Farmhouse three different times so they could interview him, so they could see what was going on. And we had some wild experiences while we were there. They were just, I mean, it was really something. It left Junichi, who is this, you know him. So he's a love of a man and just a sweetheart and a very dear friend. But he left the first time shaking his head, saying, I don't know how this is, but it is. Well, uh, no, they. it was Fibu that told me this. So I'm so happy you have everything. I'm thrilled. To no. <laughs> That's not true. But Figo is kind of a separate entity from Meyer. Because bringing up what you talked about earlier, that there was kind of this commune feeling. There were, when we got there back in 76, there was the Meyer family, the, the Wechter family, and that was it, living at the farmhouse. And together, they were kind of keeping it together. Yes, it's a chalet. Half of it was a barn, half of it was a house. When we got there, they had no running water in the house when they needed water they went outside to the water pump they filled a bucket they brought it in they put it on the stove they heated it that's how they washed their dishes they had a bucket under the sink because they didn't have plumbing that went to a sewer so then they take it out and they throw it in the garden it, it was really something billy was washing his face in a horse trough that was back in 76 in 1978, they started getting plumbing together. They added a bathroom. They were they were kind of getting into the world the rest of the world actually lived in. And it was a very, very different time then. People were coming from all over the world. They walked in all hours of the day and night, didn't bother to knock even, opened the door, walked in and said, I would demand to talk to Billy Meyer. Lee and I were there for... At one time, we spent six weeks living at the farmhouse. We spent, over a period of seven years, well over a year living at the farmhouse. But during this time, there were people from Holland, from all over South America, Africa, Europe coming in. I've got to talk to Billy. They put him on a pedestal, decided he was not human, which he is, and therefore he was unique, and they demanded his time. I finally sat down and said, Billy, you can't do this. You're not getting anything done. Because he was open and giving them the time they wanted. So I said, if they want to talk to you, make them work in the field with you. If you're going to pick potatoes out of the ground that day, let them help. And he started doing that. And it started working better for him. He didn't feel so much pressure. It was much easier on everybody there. Now, the Wachters actually worked in town, I believe in Zurich. After, they were still there, but then Bernadette Brand came in, and she was living there at the farm, and this little group started popping up called Figo. Figo's a great study group, is what it is. They study Billy's contact notes, they sit and discuss, kind of like we're going to do in a few minutes, all the different aspects of things that are going on with the case and going on with the world and how it affects them and what they should do about it. They learn how to meditate. They learn how to try to raise their consciousness. And the members of FIGO come and go, and that's okay. But it is a core group around Billy, and I can't describe it so much as a commune, but it is a group that is protective of him, will fight for him, but is also separate from him. It's like in my conversations with Billy, I don't deal with Figo, I do deal with Billy, just as you did. Well, no, I have to go, I'm going to tell you the nightmare with Figo. <laughs> I can't even go there because they were doing a peace meditation. I was there with the Italians and we were sitting there and I could see Billy standing, staring at me and, and Gunter from Figo says, you can't speak to him. And I said, <laughs> okay, I'll respond. And then he says, we're going to meditate for peace at three o'clock. And German is the perfect language and you don't speak German. So you guys have to leave. And, oh, so, boy. and so I said, well, where are we going to go? And I said to the other two Italians with me, I said, let's go down to the meditation garden. So let's meditate for peace because oh, they're doing it. So can't we do it? So we went down there and 
we we you know closed our eyes and we were meditating for peace. I open my eyes and I see Billy staring at me. <laughs> Holy moly! If, if he's supposed to be meditating for peace, what is he doing down here staring at me? And within minutes, he said, "Because he I telepathic, doesn't he?" Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, within minutes, he sent the doctor Guido Lasbruger to me, uh, and he has since passed away. And may I recommend to anybody, the only book you should be reading is, is Still a Fly that's from Billy, but this book, this 45 years, is opening a, up another door. And Britt, in, in the last 15 minutes we have, will you talk about what made you open up the door after 45 years? Yeah. Oh God, 45 years. It just, it feels like it's snapped by. Um, we have a new generation that accepts these things now. They're not beholden to the concept of fear and making it an adversary issue. I would like to get this case particularly because it is so full of beauty to this new generation. Let them play in the words of the Pleiadians. Let them dig into the evidence. Let them think, expand their minds and their consciousness. And I think the timing of it is perfect. I think we really need it right now. So what have you decided to do? I also know you guys made a movie called Contact. I think it was- Right. Yeah. What have you decided to do movie-wise book-wise, and picture book-wise. And, and okay. talk about the social media, they can advance, get copies of the picture book. Yeah, I can't call it a picture book. I'm going to show you. It's it's going to screw up cameras, so just kind of bear with. This is the new one, Contact from the Pleiades, Volume 1 and 2. But it's a book. It's 200 pages. A lot of information in there. It's the same information as volume one and volume two plus. So it has a lot more. We also have messages from the Pleiades, which is the contact notes that Billy took from the very beginning of his contacts through. We'll probably be re-releasing them sometime, hopefully the end of this year or next year. Contact is going to be re-released. We're negotiating dates on that now. And that's the documentary that was done. Great documentary. It's narrated by David Warner. And it goes through, so those of you that have heard the stories that Billy hung a UFO on a fishing line, we brought in Wally Gentleman, who did all of the special effects for miniatures, for Industrial Light and Magic, for Stanley Kubrick. He did a model for us. We hung it from a fishing line. We took photographs of it. We took movie footage of it. We ran it through photogrammetric analysis. And you know what? You can see that string. And you can see the size is completely different than anything else in the foreground or in the background. So it was obvious it was a model. So that went right out the window. But that's in contact. There's a lot of really good information in there. Um, I Lee and I started a book before he passed about our experiences with the Meyer case, because there's so many things behind the scenes that Billy told us that we experienced together that have never been brought out. Uh, the photo journals were designed to put the information out there so people could make up their own minds and make decisions based on fact. It's, it's up to them what they want to believe. But what we wanted to do and I've got it outlined, I just haven't had the time to write it yet, is write about the inside story to the Meyer case, what he experienced, what went on with us and him, how he uh, would sit up at night sometimes just beside himself because he felt so much pressure. And we'd talk him out of canceling the contacts. Several times he just wanted to quit them. He didn't want anything else to do with it. He was tired of all these strangers in his life. He was tired of having his gardens overrun. He was tired of people questioning his veracity. And we would spend all night telling him, you're doing something unique. 
And that happens when someone does something unique. So we were trying to be supportive of him and let him know that there's a lot of people out there that could garner a lot from the information that he has. Did it actually change your reality? Did you ever have sightings with him? Huh? <laughs> um, we had really interesting things. We never saw a craft there. We have seen them, but we never saw a craft there. We did see Billy leave at one night. I think it was about two o'clock in the morning, walked behind the little camp trailer we were staying in, and it was pouring rain. And he just kept walking. So Lee and I got outside. And we're all huddled up waiting to see where he's going. We're going to track him. He got to an open field and his tracks disappeared, literally. They were gone. There was nothing there. Um, we would see him show up at the other end of town. He'd been picked up for a contact right outside the farm area. And he'd show up on the other side of Schmidrudy at a place called Dusnang. Different things like that. He had no way of getting there. He wasn't on a moped and he couldn't have hiked the five miles in the short time he was gone. Lee was on a roof repairing the roof of the farmhouse with him, was talking to him. The ladder was right next to Lee, turned around and Billy's gone. They took him on a contact, according to him. So all of these different types of things we've had great experiences with. One night, we saw Billy take off on his moped. We walked outside. Everything lit up with the brightest white light you could ever imagine. Through the trees, under the trees, above the trees. It was just this piercing blue-white light. Happened three times, then it quit. Billy came back a little later, and he said they were saying hi. And this is what happened. He wasn't in the area. He didn't even know what we had seen, but he told us. Well, you just touched a, a, a nerve with me because I was in South America in the Atacama Desert and I was in a, a, a group of trees and they all lit up with bright white light. And I, uh -huh. I, uh, I can't see anything. What the heck is happening here? And the, from the bottom up, all this, but I was doing research with contact in Latin America in the Atacama Desert of Chile with the contact mm -hmm. with sea. Nordic type beings. And I never, I, I, what I saw was what you're just describing. And right. you feel fantastic because that, if that's the way they say hello, fine. And so, yeah. <laughs> with that. Uh, so, uh, your wonderful husband, who I met, has passed on uh, the, uh, the greatest ever, you know, for me, Wendell Stevens has passed on. How are you feeling as a woman now with this kind of knowledge and this even scientific background in your life now? How, how are you navigating this? How do you feel? I've lived by probably my whole life I've done this, but I've, I've really focused on living by letting life lead me because I know it's going to take me into the right directions. If I sit and plot it out, it doesn't work. So when this happened with bringing volume one and volume two back out, the publisher reached out to me and said, would you be interested? And I went, wow, yes, definitely. So these little things in life just happen to come in when they're needed. And it's not about me needing them. It's about others needing them. So I just follow wherever life leads me and I'm okay with it. But I think the timing of these things is so hugely important right now that we can't ignore it anymore. We've got to really start paying attention to what we're doing with each other, because eventually we're going to be working with others that are off world. Uh, I, I sincerely believe that uh, it, it's almost like preparing. And when you said the younger generation doesn't go through all the uh... Uh, you know, the skepticism and, you know, and it's okay to talk about UFOs because the New York Times comes out with the fact they Exactly. <laughs> yeah, my own, my own kids said, Mom, you know, they, you know, UFOs abuse the New York Times. And I said, what do you think I've been doing for 40 years? <laughs> <laughs> because it, yeah. about Tic Tacs uh, and all that, it's okay 
So, <laughs> but any case, uh, I, I, I really, I, I appreciate your support of my work, but also I, I have gone to Smith Rudy. I have seen Billy. I have seen the the landscapes that are in the um in the, in the films and in the in the gorgeous photos. And I was one of the first ones to actually talk about the case, but that was also the ones they crucified me on the most. So I'm sure. thrilled that, that this is happening after 45 years. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for talking to me and for sharing with us everything. And I, I'm going to ask, this is going to do a section on Gaia with Regina Meredith. So don't miss mm -hmm. He's going to, I think it's in March sometime, isn't it? We record in March. I'm not sure what the air date will be. 